women met for the first time since graduating from high school. One asked the other, you were always so organized in school. Did you manage to live a well-planned life? Yes, said her friend. My first marriage was a millionaire to a millionaire. My second marriage was to an actor. And my third marriage was to a preacher. And now I'm married to an undertaker. Her friend asked, what do those marriages have to do with a well-planned life? One for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. <laughs> Did you hear that Larry Lepree died? Well, he wrote the Hokey Pokey. He died peacefully in his sleep at the age of 93. Apparently, the most traumatic part for his family was getting him into the coffin. They put his left leg in, and then the trouble began. <laughs> Oh, those are pretty bad, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, pretty bad. <laughs> well, I'll go down to the geriatric ward and I'll share this one. Three sisters, I can relate to this, age 92, 94, and 96, live in a house together. One night, the 96-year-old draws a bath. She puts her foot in and pauses. She yells down the stairs, Was I getting in or out of the bath? <laughs> Don't laugh at that. The four-year-old yells back, I don't know. I'll come up and see. She starts up the stairs and pauses and yells, Was I going up the stairs or down the stairs? <laughs> the 92-year-old is sitting on the table, I'm no, at the kitchen table, having tea, listening to her sisters. She shakes her head and says, I sure hope I never get that forgetful. She knocks on the wood for a good measure. She then yells, I'll get it I, 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 and help both of you as soon as I... I go answer the door. You guys laugh. Ask Walt. It happens, doesn't it? <laughs> well, one more, and then I quit. There was a painter by the name of Jack. Hey, Jack the painter. Who was very interested in making a penny when he could, so he often would thin his paint to make it go farther. As it happened, he got away with this for some time, but eventually the church decided to, I know what's wrong, it's the glasses. The church decided to do a big restoration job that involved the painting of one of its largest churches. Jack put in his bid, and because his price was low, he got the job. He went about erecting that vessels and setting up the planks and buying the paint, and yes, thinning it down with the turpentine. Jack went up to the sca up the, on the scaffolding, painted away with the job. When it was nearly completed, when suddenly there was a horrendous clap of thunder and the sky opened up. The torrential rain washed the thin paint off the church and knocked Jack off the scaffolding and to the lawn among the gravestones surrounding the telltale puddles of the thinned out and useless paint. Jack was no fool. He knew that this was a judgment from the Almighty. So he got on his knees and cried, Oh God, God, please forgive me. What shall I do? And from the thunder, a mighty voice spoke, Repaint, repaint, and thin no more. <laughs> and I just pray, oh God, that we see tonight how awesome you are. Forgive us, O oh God, for trying to make you in our image. Allow us to give you freedom to make us in your image. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we're in the book of Esther. So open up your Bibles. I don't think this has ever happened where the weekly character is the same um, place we are in the Bibles we go through with Rod Hambry. That's exciting. I was assigned uh, 5 through 10 or whatever, but I'm thinking, oh, no, 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 where is he? Over there. Uh, those of you, uh, most of us are familiar with the book of Esther, but just to bring us up to where we're going to start, we know it's taking place in captivity. The Jews, amongst many other different countries, are a part of this vast empire of the of this Medes and Persians, actually it's primarily the Persians. And uh, the Jews were just one of the many. And um, the king, I think that's one thing, the movie that we saw during the daytime really portrayed him well because he was quite unstable, but he was the king. 
And he had, uh, you know the story, he had a uh, almost a semi-world's fair for six months. He had a big party going on the last week. It was like drinks on the house and everybody was three sheets to the wind, is that what we used to call it? And uh, when his wife refused to go in and prayed herself in front of him and his cronies, uh, in his drunken stupor, he was talked into getting rid of her. So he did. And of course, when he passed that, stamped that ring, sealed that deal, you don't change it. So there he is without a wife. His friends say, well, why don't you run a beauty contest? Only this beauty contest, my friends, people didn't sign up. They went and got them. And they went out through the country or the area and picked up all the young girls. And amongst the young girls who was picked up was a little Jewish girl. Her name was Hadessa. She's been raised by her cousin, Mordecai, because her parents have died. And uh, she's scooped up like the rest of them. And she's taken in for the years treatment, beauty treatment, to get her ready to see if she's gonna win this contest. Well, we know the story. She wins. And she becomes the queen. And of course, Mordecai told her, don't ever let him or anybody else know you're Jewish. You might have some problems there. So she agreed, and there she was, the queen. Open up your Bibles and let's thumb through a couple of these chapters we can bring up to date. At the end of chapter 2, uh, in the beginning of 20, around 21, it says that there was, a, there was a plot to kill the king. And Mordecai just so happened to overhear the plot. And Mordecai, instead of saying, well, it's not my business, he took it upon himself to make it his business. And he got the message to Esther, who, by the way, was the name he gave her so that she wouldn't sound like a Jewish gal. And she tells the king about this plot. And sure enough, the two are brought in, they were found guilty, and they were hanged. In those days, they had a giant a book like a spiral that you get in the education office, I'm sure, but this is much bigger than that. And they just kept the running journal of all the events of the day. So they made sure they wrote down in that book exactly what happened and what day and so forth. In chapter 3, we meet the villain. We meet the man who we learn to really hate. His name is Haman. Look in chapter 3, verse 1. It tells you about his background. It says that he's an Agagite, which means he's an Amalekite. Those of you who remember the story, do you remember the story with, uh, with Saul? What was he supposed to do with all those Amalekites? What was he supposed to do? And remember the king that he brought? You know, that was, this guy's related to that man. So there's no love lost between these people to start with. And so Haman, need to keep that in mind. So Haman is an opportunist, and he's weaseled his way in where he now is head honcho over everybody there besides the king. And he is just so full of pride and so forth. And we meet him, and there's orders that they need to bow down to him because after all, he is next to the king. Well, Mordecai, who's weaseled his way inside the court, he's in there, and of course, he's a good Jew especially with an Amalekite. There's no way he's going to bow down to him. And we know that causes problems. How many know that anybody who's a big egotist is not happy until everyone, everyone bows down to them? Maybe we know some of these people. Anyways, Mordecai is very upset. And he notices that he does not bow down. Look at verse 5 of chapter 3. It says, When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, he, uh, Haman was what? Was filled with wrath. He's just really boiling inside of him. And, um, but he was so upset about it that he told his people, um, the people, and he came up with a plan. He said, I'm going to get rid of all of them. So he goes to the king and he says, King, you know you got a group of people here living amongst you that really, they're not following your rules, they got their own rules, they won't work for you on Saturdays. You know, 
He says, they're gonna cause trouble in the future. And the king who listens to everybody, you know, he goes, well, what, what do you think we should do about it? Well, Haman knew what he was going to do. He said, I'll tell you what, why don't we just get rid of them all? Well, the king wasn't too sure about that. But then Haman says, I'll give you a, a 10,000 uh, yeah. pieces of silver for it. You know, and right away the king says, that's looking better. So he writes up an edict. He gets it stamped, official, that at a certain day, 13th day of our December, that they were going to go throughout the entire empire and annihilate all the Jews. And so this proposal, of course, Haman thinks he's got it made now. And so the, um, the edict goes out, and of course Mordecai finds out about it. And Mordecai, oh, it just breaks his heart. He mourns in typical Jewish fashion, tears his clothes and puts sackcloth and ashes on his head. You know, he just carries on. And all of a sudden, Nestor gets wind of that there's this guy down there, and he, she, he, she finds out it's Mordecai that's carrying on. And she sends a message down, find out what his problem is. And so Mordecai comes and sends a message. Look in chapter, um, chapter 4. Draw your attention to chapter 4 and verse 7. And Mordecai told him, the messenger, that all that had happened to him and a sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasure to destroy the Jews. He also gave a copy of the decree of this destruction in order for him to give to Esther. And he says, I want you to explain to her that he and that and that he might command her to go to the king to make supplication for him and plead before him for her people. In other words, Esther, you gotta do something about this. You're married to the king. You go there and let's you're, we're all gonna go. And you know, you look at this book, my friends. And you see one major crisis after another. And here we have a situation where here she is, queen, and now she's finding out that there's a plot to kill everybody. So what is she going to do? Let's take a look at the next. Let's take a look at um, verse. Uh, Esther spoke, and she, verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to be with him for 30 days. What is she saying? The kings of the Persian Empire... This, the more I studied that, I couldn't believe it. They were protected. They were not to hear any bad news. And they were the ones that would decide, decide who was going to come into their presence to speak. And remember, he's got a harem of all kinds of women. And Esther is saying, look, it's been 30 days and he hasn't paid any attention to me. He hasn't asked me. Seen me in bed. I haven't seen him in 30 days. And you want me to go in there? And we know the guy's unstable to start with. And you know, she's got she's got a dilemma. She says, I can't go in there. Well, I love, I love what what Mordecai tells her. Look at verse 13. Esther, listen carefully, Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. All right? Do you think you're going to be protected? No. If you just keep your mouth shut, you're going to also be killed. Okay, that was the first point he made. The second point he made, he said, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Second point. With or without you, we're God's people. With or without you, we've got a covenant keeping God. With or without you, God is going to intervene. 
And then her last point, he says, Esther, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. The key thing about the book of Esther, listen carefully, is that we understand that God is God. There's an aspect of God that we call his transcendent, which means his realm is beyond time and space. He sees the beginning from the end. You can't contain him. We can't comprehend this because he's God. And it's like he's looking down there and he's seeing all this happening. All this is going on. So what's our dear Esther going to do? Now she's the ball's in her court, isn't it? Verse 15, Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast, that's the immediate city there, and fast for me, neither eat nor drink, for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai, Mordecai went his way and did according to what Esther commanded him to do. Um, we read that and we say, boy, she's brave. She's boy. And you know, there's a gap between the end of four and the beginning of five. She's resolved that she's going to spend three days of fasting and praying. And chapter five, that period is over. And we need to realize that that's a very important gap. It's a gap of silence where she went and sought and prayed. There's a, um, we often say, reminded me of um, Isaiah, where we read in, those who wait upon the Lord, what? Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like wings of eagles. They shall, what? Run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. And this is what she's doing. She's waiting on the Lord. And I'm going to stress this. We're not saying she's sitting there, oh, I wonder what God's going to do now. Oh, I, I, I wonder how he's going to work this out. No, that's not what the word wait means. In Hebrew, the word wait means to entwine. It's like taking a rope. And let's pretend like this symbolizes God. And to wait is to literally, and that's us, is to literally entwine yourself in God. It means taking your mind and your heart and lifting it and putting it in the heavenlies with God. That's what it means to wait on God. I think the silence times are the hardest times. We sing that song, but even when I can't see it, what? Working. He's working. Yeah. He's still working. He's still working. We sing it very, he's still working. How many people have been in a silent time? I know Pastor Walt's in a silent time. There's times when you need direction or you have a crisis and God, where are you? This is what's happening here. <coughs> she is resolved to go. If she dies, like Paul said, what? To me, to live is what? Christ, and to die is gain. I'm going for it. But it was very important for her to take that time and center on the Lord. Um, and when I thought about Isaiah 40, I think, you know, what, what she's going to gain? Gain strength. It says, and then you're going to arise like on wings of eagles. She's going to get a better perspective, right? Eagles can see down the fantastic eye see sight, right? Extra energy, and she's going to be able to go the distance. That's what Isaiah 40 is talking about. And she is going to seek that and see what happens. Isaiah 41.10 says, do not fear, for I'm with you. 
Do not be anxious, do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, surely I will help you, surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That was the New American Standard Version. Psalms 32, what does he say? I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. He's there. He's there. Sending yourself, focusing yourself for those times. Fasting and praying. Now we pick up chapter 5. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and she decided to go, she's going to go for it. She's going to go for it. She enters his presence and of course she was walking in there with her confidence. I can just see her. Of course she's got to keep her hand down because she's not supposed to look in his eyes. Bunch of, I'd never make a queen there. Anyways, walking. <laughs> And with dignity, confidence, where's her head? Her head's up here. Her head's up here. She's tuned into the Lord. She's listening to what He has to say to her. Yes. And I can't help but, I don't want to read into the text, but I can't help but think that God's saying, All right, Esther, come and listen to me. You got it. We're going to, go, we're going to do this. You're here for this time. This is your time. This is your moment. And she's going to go in there. And sure enough, the king sees her, extends the scepter, and says, My queen, verse 3. What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. And so, the Esther, now me, you know, let me tell you something. I really do believe if she wouldn't have spent that time fasting and praying, if she would have just shown up, she probably would have pulled a Louine. I'll tell you what it is. See that guy over there? He's a skunk. Do you know what he's doing? I mean, I would have just let him have it. Right, Walt? Yeah. I would have just let him have it. But she keeps her cool. She didn't even say anything about it. She said, hey, I want you and Haman to go over to my place for a little bite to eat. I'm going to have a little banquet. Isn't that amazing? And that's, that's what she tells them. And so they have the little banquet and and the king says, oh, my dear, what is it that you want to tell me? Uh, I want you and him to come tomorrow to another little banquet at my house. You know, you're going, what is this all about? Timing is everything with the Lord. Don't rush him. Timing is everything with the Lord. You know, it's kind of like the guy who was swimming in a lake. He was way off his shore and just having a great time. And all of a sudden, this huge, this, the fog rolls in and he can't see anything. And he's thrashing. Oh, I think it's over here. I got to get to shore. No, I think it's over here. Before you know it, he's just thrashing and he's going in all different directions. He's panicking. And you know, what do I do? Where do I go? What? And he's trying hard to find until he got sense enough to lie on his back and float a little bit until he could pull himself together. And this is kind of what's happening here. That silence got her to the point where she's tuned into God and she's listening and she's going to just listen to God and see what he wants her to do. Well, we're going to find out why he had to do that. But of course, now we're going to see Haman in all his glory. Haman, of course, goes home. Look at this, he says. He says, he, he's all, I'm sure he thinks, man, I'm really big stuff. I've been invited to, went to a dinner, and I'm going tomorrow to the dinner, and the queen herself invited me, you know. And, of course, he's strutting his stuff like a proud peacock, and Mordecai is there, and Mordecai does not bow down to him, and that infuriates him. Oh, then he goes in verse 11 of chapter 5. He wants to really just... A revel in his glory. He tells his wife and friends, he says, look at he says, I got great riches, I've got multitude of children, everything which the king has, everything in which the king has promoted me him. He's telling him everything that he's gotten. And then he says, and I've been advanced and but I I the king has advanced me above the officials. I am just, you know, big stuff, and the queen invited me to dinner, and da-da-da-da-da. And then he says at 13, he says, yes, 
All this avails me nothing as so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the gate. And of course his wife, friend said to him, well, why don't you just get rid of him? That's a good idea. When they say they're going to build a gallows, we have a picture of the Wild West with a noose. Eh? Uh -uh. Not the Persians. The Persians had a, they impaled people. They took them and they rammed a spear through them and then they stuck them on a... Uh, that's what they meant when they talk about a gallows. And so, but you know, people like this that have such hatred and malice, they're not just in the Bible. I have an article here that I got out of the local paper a number of years ago. And because of time, I, don't, I won't read about to share with you what this man did. This man um, had a girlfriend, and the girlfriend was on a trip, and the man's father died. And he asked her to come home and be with him because he was so grieved that his dad died. And the lady said, no, I'm, I'm with my parents and we're doing this. And she did not come home. And the man was furious. Do you know what he did? He married her. Has this all planned out. He had confessed to this. He married her, got her pregnant, and then waited to that child and her bonded. And then he killed the child. And he said, I killed the child because I wanted her to experience the pain I felt when my dad died and she wasn't there for me. That is malice. That is malice. And you've got a man just like that in Haman here. Haman, I mean, he says, I'll show this Mordecai. Well, let's hurry on. The story gets, we're almost there. It gets better. But look what happens. He says, he's got a plan now. He's going to go to the king and I'm going to make sure this guy gets killed. And this is that night. That night. Get the picture. He's got the plan. He's going to spend the night, and then early in the morning, he's going to go to the king and tell him his plans. And, you know, the king's going to say, oh, yeah, what the heck? Who's this guy? <laughs> well, it says that night, the king, what? Couldn't sleep. He had insomnia. And so he says, you know what? He says, why don't you bring out the records of the Chronicles? You know, people, it's like reading our Chronicles or reading the phone book. Uh, you know, boring because they're going to try to put the guy back to sleep. And so he just opened up the Chronicles just by, well, opened up the Chronicles. And where do they read? They read to the incident when Mordecai was able to save the king's life. Yes. And the king, he's half asleep. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, who is this guy? Hey, what do we do for this guy? He said, well, we didn't do anything for the guy. It must have been pretty late that night because dawn was breaking, and here comes Haman. Here comes Haman. Boy, he's ready to go. And as he's going to go in, the, um, the eunuch or the servant said, oh, Haman's here. And the king says, well, bring him in. He said, hey, Haman, what do you think I should do? I gotta, you have to help me. I want to honor a man. And you know, egotists, you know, they think everybody's about me, right? And he goes into this elaborate description of what they should do. He says, oh, I think you should put him on your horse, and I think you should pray him around, and I think, and yada, 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 yada. And he thinks he's the one that's going to be honored. <laughs> And the king says, and I want you, because I want you to take Mordecai, the Jew, and honor him for what he did for me. Can you imagine? God is awesome. Timing. It's timing. You never know what little incidents in your life are important. Don't rush it. Just a little insomnia. Yeah. For a Christian, there is no coincidence. There is no luck. Yes. We have a sovereign, transcendent God who knows the beginning from the end, and you just have to be in tune, take that time to set your heart and your mind in Christ, and He is going to 
You're going to be like, he's going to be like the hand and you're the glove. And he's just literally going to move and you're going to see little things. You're going to look back and say, oh my gosh, it was when I stopped to do that, then that happened. And then that, oh my, God is in control. And we know in the end what happens to him. He ends up being on that which he had set up for Mordecai. But the message tonight, you guys, is that we have a transcendent God, a God that's beyond our understanding. We have got to stop telling God what to do. We have got to stop saying, hey, I, he says right here, now you do this and you do that. Let's, uh, let's start expanding our understanding who God is. You know, a little holy fear. And realize, though, that as you seek his face and you line yourself up with him, he is going to direct your paths. And that's a guarantee. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much, God. I just pray, Lord, that every one of us in here is like that guy in that lake. And sometimes we can't see you, God. We can't hear you. And we're thrashing all around. Help us, oh God, to flip over and float. Help us, O oh God, to set our heart and our mind in the hands of you so that you then can direct our steps and that we go according to your timing and we see, O oh God, that your will continues to flourish in our life. Thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just miss.